Welcome everyone. My name is Mary Snowden Lorenze. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Career Services at NYU Wagner. Thank you for joining our Identity and Diversity in Public Service event focused on race, segregation, and Black suburbia. This event is co-hosted by NYU Wagner and the Urban Initiative, and we will be recording today to share with you later. We have three phenomenal speakers today. Orly Clerge, Assistant Professor of Sociology at UC Davis. Kimberly Johnson, Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis and Affiliate Faculty of NYU Wagner. And lastly, Ingrid Gould Ellen, NYU Wagner's Paulette Goddard, Professor of Urban Policy and Planning and Faculty Director of the NYU Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Speaker bios are going to be available in the chat soon, and you can read much more about our speakers today. Today's conversation will also include an opportunity to ask all of our speakers questions via the Q&A chat function later in our program. Before we start the conversation, we'll begin now with a brief lightning talk from Professor Clerget's book, The New Noir, Race, Identity, and Diaspora in Black Suburbia. Professor Clergy, welcome again, and thank you for sharing your book with us all. The floor is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction, Mary. I want to express my gratitude to the team at NYU Wagner, um, to Mary, Ankara, Raquel, and Susan, who really have made it possible for me to be in conversation with the intellectual giants, Kimberly Johnson and Ingrid Gould Allen. Um, also, I wanna thank the audience for joining us here today and for being a part of this conversation um, in the midst of everything everyone has going on as the year is coming, um, coming to an end. Uh, this is really a full circle moment for me. I'm currently living in Sacramento presenting from the land of the Nisanan people. Um, but I am originally from New York and was a fellowship, was a part of the Fellowship for Emerging Leaders and Public Service at Wagner. So it's really nice to be back in, in this capacity as a scholar. So today my lightning talk will um, revolve around my recently published book called The New Noir, Race, Identity and Diaspora and Black Suburbia. So I am an urban ethnographer who studies race and racism, immigration and migration, as well as education. My work interrogates how the cultures of spaces of upward mobility, specifically suburban neighborhoods, are being challenged and remade by Black communities in the kind of post-civil rights era. So as more families of color uh, move to suburbia to achieve their home ownership dreams and to, um, to and or also escape the unaffordability of gentrifying urban areas uh, only to encounter new forms of exclusion um, is really a timely and urgent line of inquiry for us as, as scholars and practitioners. And this research agenda has led me to publish The New Noir, which explores the cultural politics, the cultural geographies, the cultural identities of middle class Black American, Haitian, and Jamaican adults in areas that I call diasporic suburbs. My research took place on the other side of the 59th Street Bridge, um, for those of you who are tuning in from New York, uh, in the eastern sections of New York. Uh, it spans across Queens County and Nassau County, expanding really our understanding of Black geography in New York beyond places like Harlem and Bed-Stuy in the South Bronx. Queens and Nassau have some of the highest black household incomes in New York. Um, they're home to some, of, uh, some very, very affluent black families. And at the beginning of my research, the median household black, median black household income in New York hovered around $41,000, but was much higher uh, in Queens at $58,000 um, per year and even higher in Nassau County covering around 81,000. I conducted a multi-site ethnography in two middle-class suburban communities in New York. So the first was located in Cascades, Queens, and the second site is in Great Park, um, located in Nassau County. And Cascades and Great Park are the pseudonyms that I use for the actual research locations in order to protect the privacy of my interviewees. So the major difference between Cascades and Great Park is their class and racial composition. 
Cascades is a hyper-racially segregated area with a population that is over uh, three-fourths black, right, and also has a um, significantly high foreign-born population. Great Park, which is located on Long Island, is more racially integrated, right? It's one-third black, one-third white, one-third Latinx. Um, however, uh, this area also was uh, in the midst of seeing a significant decline in its white population. And we can talk about the reasons for that in the, in the Q&A and discussion. I spent over a thousand hours doing participant observations and ob observations in both neighborhoods. Um, I also did 120 in-depth interviews with 60 Black families, 20 of whom were African-American, uh, 20 of whom were Jamaican, and the other 20 um, were of Haitian uh, background. And <clears throat> these interviews were split evenly across Cascades and Great Park. The overarching research question that motivates my work is, how do middle class Black families negotiate their cultural identities in multinational and multiracial suburbs like Cascades and, and Great Park? A diasporic framework um, essentially anal uh, anal analytically organizes my book. As an ethnographer, my field work in Cascades and Great Park made it very clear that in order for me to understand the cultural life and cultural politics of the people and the places that I was studying, I had to really develop a historiography of their migrations to New York City and its suburbs from the mid 20th century to the 21st century. And we can find um, the details of that historiography in chapter three of the book called Blood Pudding. Um, the first image represents the Great Migration, right? When millions of um, Black people left the American South and moved to uh, the American North, particularly Northern cities, to escape the racial terror of of the Jim Crow South, right, in the 20th century, um, essentially between 1910 and 1970. Um, and New York was one of their top destinations, right, and this was the story of many of my Black American respondents and their families. The second image is of anti-colonial protests in Jamaica in the 1960s, which led to the fall of British colonial rule on the island nation. However, post-colonial Jamaica continued to really be entrenched in um, poverty leading to the outmigration of Jamaican professionals and Jamaican working class folk and their families in search of material freedom in cities like New York and London. The third image represents the Duvalier dictatorship's militiamen, right, the Tonton Maku in Haiti, whose violence and repression sent hundreds of thousands from every class data, strata in Haiti into exile uh, in cities like New York and Paris and Montreal. I theorize Cascades and Great Park as diasporic Black suburbs. What does this mean? So Black diasporic suburbs are distinct from how we think about white suburbs or um, what Wei Lee is calling Asian and Latinx um, ethnoburbs, right? So first, Black diasporic suburbs are transgeographical spaces, right? These are places that have really received flows of migrants from across the Black Atlantic world. These migrants maintain ongoing ties to the American South as well as the global South um, from which they come. Second, which is really important to today's talk on the history of suburbs and the legacies of suburbs is that residents in black diasporic suburbs are inheriting the racialized spatial histories of slavery and Jim Crow um, in Queens and Long Island. So I spent quite some time in the New York Public Library archives. And I learned that the places which we call suburbs today were really the rural lands of plantation slavery in New York and also home to runaway and free, <laughs> runaway slave and free black communities across Queens and Long Island. So this history matters for how we think about current racial inequalities in suburbs, which are essentially baked into the soil um, and into uh, property management in these areas. And as Black people have moved into suburbs that were created for whites only in large number since the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, they have really inherited, I argue, the legacies of segregation and therefore unequal suburbs that were never created to really include them. And third, residents of these spaces are also engaged in creating, recreating, and co-creating culture. The encounters of these migrants across racial, class, and nationality differences, I argue, give way to the articulation of old as well as new individual and collective identities. <laughs> 
Although Black life in Queens and Long Island began centuries ago, Black suburbanization to these spaces expanded in the 40s and 50s as Harlemites sought larger homes with backyards and quieter lifestyles that resembled their Southern upbringings. They were denied entry to many newly developed white areas like Levittown on Long Island, uh, which had anti-Black racial covenants um, written into their foundation. However, a number of both working class and Black elite families defied Jim Crow segregation and settled in Queens, Long Island and uh, Westchester County. Black celebrities and scholars such as Louis Armstrong, pictured here in his Corona Queens neighborhood and civil rights activist, Shirley Graham and her husband, the first American sociologist, W.B. Du Bois, married in her Queens home before moving into exile in Ghana in the 1960s. Despite this rich, rich history, racial and economic injustice in Queens and Long Island is still a pressing issue with whites maintaining power and control over the political and economic affairs of most of the areas and, and, and towns in the area. Long Island, for example, like Queens is divided, it's unequal and it's contested despite its diversity and creating conditions for movements for racial justice like Black Lives Matter to really thrive there, which we saw this year um, with the death of, or with the murder of George Floyd. Despite the continued assumption that the suburbs are white spaces and cities are black spaces, the election of, pre of president and vice president-elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris was made real by record turnouts in both chocolate cities as well as chocolate suburbs in key states such as Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Georgia. This was particularly the case for black and Latinx, Gen Z and millennial voters who turned out in record numbers to protest the multiple pandemics of COVID-19, of police violence, of climate change. And this was happening in New York suburbs and the city as well as suburban towns. So this reveals the continued urgency for understanding the cultural meanings behind the racial categories, migrations, places and spaces, um, which my body of work really engages. So in conclusion, the set of sociological questions I am asking in my work and in the new, new noir really helps us understand what has been unfolding during this historic election season and really has been in the making over centuries of racialized shifts in democracy and capitalism in cities and suburbs. Thank you. Thank you, Orly, um, for that. Um, just at least a, a taste of the book. Um, and Kim, could you? Um, I, offer sort of a, a, some reflections um, given, uh, given your work on, on Black suburbs as well? Great. So first of all, let me say that I think this book is just phenomenal and I'm just so excited to have another chance to, to talk it up. Um, because I think what Orly has done in her work has really made visible what has long been considered invisible, which are um, Black suburbs. So I, in this idealized world of, of suburbia, um, particularly the idealized world that uh, Donald Trump tried to push uh, during the election, uh, is the idea of, of suburbs being populated by largely white, uh, uh, heterosexual uh, couples with uh, sort, of the, sort of quote unquote traditional nuclear families um, who, by and large lived in a world that was largely privatized, that one had their own automobile, one had their own car, that one had their own yard, um, and that the need for public services was sort of moot because you had your, your house in the suburbs. And I think what Orly shows is that suburbs, first of all, were never quite like that. Um, and particularly what she calls diasporic suburbs show that suburbs really come in a lot of different varieties. Um, and I particularly think that her idea her putting forth the idea that black suburban spaces really are distinctive spaces. That is that they reflect geographic and, and, and diasporic flows. Um, so it's not only African-Americans or, or I should say blacks leaving center cities to go to suburbs, but these are actually people from uh, the Caribbean, from Latin America, um, moving from their countries of origin and perhaps not even settling in central cities but actually going directly to the suburbs. And so the idea of, of suburbs as being this point 
of entry and this melting pot among different diasporic populations, I think is really um, important and points to the notion of, of suburbs being seen as not cities, but certainly not seen as this sort of leave it to beaver um, idea that uh, I think has been put forward uh, consistently in, in many parts of the media. I think the other thing that Orly's book does is that it shows that Black suburban life is a series of encounters and negotiations. Um, whether a Black suburb is a poor, hyper-segregated suburb or a well-to-do, hyper-segregated suburb. And so one of the things that I and uh, others that I'm working for uh, have looked at is the ways in which Black suburbs are actually different, not only are they different from white suburbs, but they're different from each other. Um, and I think taking into account these differences is really important um, that a, a close in inner ring suburb uh, that is largely poor and has, uh, has carried the legacies of, uh, of disinvestment, uh, the legacies of early suburbanization uh, looks quite different from say a, a, a middle class or upper middle class suburb in uh, Atlanta or in say Prince George's County. Um, and so what I think is needed and what we're seeing from work from like Orleans and, and others is this I, is a, a really new understanding of, of black politics. Um, and I think also a new understanding of, of suburban politics as well. Um, I think the second thing I would say about um, Orleans work is that it really shows that uh, the Trump administration should have read her book before they uh, uh, started going down their suburban strategy. Um, the idea that um, suburbs are, are not diverse um, is simply not true. In our work, we found that um, of the top 100 uh, largest metropolitan areas in the United States, um, there are 900 black suburbs across these uh, across these metropolitan areas, and they really do vary. Um, and so black suburbs are kind of everywhere. Um, the other thing I think that they should have, that they could have uh, realized um, about, um, about suburban areas is that not only are they diverse in terms of race, but they're also diverse in terms of ethnicity. Um, that the suburbs of Atlanta, the black Americans of, of Atlanta, are kind of different from say the black Americans of Prince George's County uh, or the black Americans who live uh, in Long Island or, or New Jersey. And so again, I think that's something that they could have really learned from, um, from Orly's book. I think what they could have learned from Orly's book and from other work uh, is that issues around policing, around education, around housing are issues that are not simply urban, i.e. central city issues, but they're issues that affect everybody in suburbia. Um, who is the police there to protect? How do they protect? Who do they sort of welcome into neighborhoods and who do they not welcome into neighborhoods? Um, one of the things I'm always struck by and I think people are surprised by is when we think about uh, the, uh, the death of Michael Brown. Michael Brown uh, lived and died in Ferguson. Ferguson was originally a white flight suburb that transitioned to a majority black suburb. Um, we also know, of course, from the Ferguson case that the city uh, faced uh, numerous financial difficulties, partly because of disinvestment that was triggered because of, of increased black population growth. Um, this caused issues in school financing. Uh, so the school system of Ferguson was uh, troubled to say the least. Um, there was extensive retail, what we would now call retail redlining, the sort of extraction um, and an absence of, of, of certain kinds of retail that add to the quality of life of, of folks. Um, and we know that certainly uh, because of this lack of commercial investment uh, and the, the uh, accompanied uh, lack of valuation of black households. I mean, that's the other thing that we now know is that black houses are systematically undervalued relative to white houses with the houses being exactly the same. Um, we also know that because of this uh, systematic undervaluing, that black spaces, black suburban spaces tend to be overtaxed, um, which leads to less uh, funding available for public services. 
So all this creates a cycle um, in which places like Ferguson end up uh, turning on their citizens um, and trying to extract more and more different kinds of revenues. So I think one of the things we can really take from this is that black suburban spaces are not the same. Uh, they're governed differently. There are different kinds of politics that are engaged that they're engaged in in uh, these suburban spaces. Um, and that's something I think we really need to be attuned to, to the same extent that we thought really hard and quite carefully about urban politics, say in the 1960s and 70s. I think we need to take our, our critical lens and turn it to suburbs, especially black suburbs as well. Thank you, Kim, for those um, really, really thoughtful insights. Um, and uh, thank you again, Orly, for um, again, this, this fantastic book that has spurred this conversation. Um, I want to just maybe start by, um, and, and let me also just actually remind the audience that um, there will be time for um, Q&A, um, probably in about 20 minutes or so. Um, so get your questions ready, and um, so we can so we can uh, discuss them um, in in fifteen or twenty minutes. But um, I, I want to pick up Kim where you started about sort of di diversity and heterogeneity. I mean, Orly, your your book reveals just this you know really rich, nuanced portrait of the black middle class, and also a rich nuanced portrait of the suburbs, you know, and it, it, it clearly shows that the suburbs that um, Donald Trump was purportedly trying to save um, are, are far more diverse than his, than his uh, rhetoric and I think conventional wisdom would suggest. And so I guess, um, you know, how do we, I guess one question, maybe this is sort of gonna be obvious, but it's sort of, you know, why do black suburbs continue to be sort of hidden in our collective imagination? and and do you exp do you see that changing somewhat? And sort of what are what are the consequences? I mean, I, it's you know it's a question for both of you. I can take it, uh, or if you want to jump in after. Um, I think that one of the things that happens is that um, black uh, spaces can get racialized. Um, and so if we think about a case of, um, of Ferguson that went through a very rapid change in population within a decade, it went from uh, less than 2% uh, black to over 60, 70% black, uh, it gets known as a black space. And I think once that racialization happens, it is sort of interesting. I, what I found in my work is that it shifts into being seen as urban. Um, yeah. And so I think one of the things that happens is that suburban space gets recoded as urban. Um, I think there was a recent article that came out uh, which asked a vast number of people, how would they define a suburb? Um, and it turned out that a lot of people define suburbs as suburbs that included people who looked like them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that is part of the reason for this really invisibility is that I think that the sort of tight linkage between space and racial identity uh, hasn't been unpacked. Um, and so simply people simply can't see these spaces as suburban spaces. Yeah, so it's sort of this term, the sort of urbanized suburb, right? It's really code word, code language. So, and Orly? Yeah, I think something that um, to pick off, off of uh, what Kim was just saying, I think history really matters, right? So the formation of suburbia, um, it was essentially a, a racial project, right? And we, uh, understand the development of post-war suburbs, they were created for whites only, right? Um, they were a part of the, um, uh, this kind of effort from the federal and as well as local governments to really bring America back to its kind of economic prosperity or create new modern um, ideas of economic prosperity and to use white families um, as, as really the center of that, right? And so I think that we really haven't let go of that uh, kind of historical reality. And in my book, I, um, what I try to do is demonstrate that suburbs were created really as technologies of white supremacy, right? And so when I'm speaking about white supremacy, that's white supremacy in politics, right? You know, suburbs is being this kind of cradle of American, you know, political life. Um, you know, when politicians are going out there, we saw this in this election cycle, it was all about how will the suburban woman vote, i.e. white yeah. woman, right? There's that assumption yeah, there. The soccer moms, the white soccer moms. It's always, it's always been there. So that's the political piece of it. 
Um, and, and there's also this kind of economic piece, right? The suburbs were created um, and really allowed for uh, poor and working class whites to become a part of this white middle class, right? And so I think America is still very much tied to that perception of itself, not only that the nation of the US is, is white, but that it's very kind of, you know, its suburbs are, you know, the site of the nuclear family, the, you know, two children, the car, you know, the backyard, and, you know, that kind of cultural identity is still so central to how America sees itself. And so I think letting go of that, um, you know, <laughs> means letting go of some level of power um, over uh, the American kind of political imagination and identity. So I think that's why it's really challenging to engage with black suburbs, right? Because the idea is that the suburbs were created to, you know, to establish a white middle class and to say that blacks too can be middle class, blacks too are educated, blacks, right? Um, is, 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 I think, um, antithetical to the racial project that has been created historically in the US. So space and race and place all being tied, tied into that. So, so I'd love to sort of follow up on that a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, partially given my work, when I think about suburbs, I think about exclusion. That's the first thing that pops to mind, right? I think about racial exclusion. I think about economic exclusion. I, you know, I think about, you know, restrictive land use regulations. Um, and so, you know, I'm wondering, um, and this is really a question for, for both of you, it's sort of, I mean, I love this term, maybe, maybe orally first, sort of this term, the sort of spatial inheritance. And so, so what does it mean? Um, and, and how, sort of how is the, um, did, you know, are these sort of, how, how, how did sort of the, the politics and also the sociology of exclusion sort of, how do, how do they differ in, in black suburbs and in multi-ethnic suburbs? versus white suburbs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I came up with this, um, this term, you know, spatial inheritance after reading Andrew Weiss's book, right, called the you know, Places of Their Own, where he identifies, you know, he provides this very rich history of black life in suburbs pre um, the 1940s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he really gives us the sense that black suburbs um, you know, have been around since the early 20th century, not in this, as Kim talked about in, in, um, in her comments, as, you know, these spaces where, you know, uh, husband and heterosexual family moves and, you know, they have their, their children, et cetera, but they were actually service working class suburbs. So um, as a part of the movement of the great migration of Black Americans from the American South to American cities like, uh, Northern cities like New York, um, they weren't only finding work in urban areas, but they were also moving out to suburban areas in Queens and Long Island in order to work for white families, right? Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, our transportation networks weren't, aren't what, you know, what they are today. And so they had to establish living areas, communities adjacent to these white affluent towns, right? Um, and so they established unincorporated suburbs. Right, and when a sub, you know suburban town is unincorporated, it meant that it really wasn't, uh, it didn't have this kind of governmental structure that white suburbs did. It was essentially neglected and, and abandoned, right? And so, um, uh, you know, work, you know, folks, women who are working in domestic working class positions um, for white families and black men who were working, um, you know, in construction or sometimes the fishing and whaling industry. On Long Island, they were living in suburban settings, but these areas weren't affluent at all. They were um, areas where the housing was really um, poor quality, um, where the educational opportunities were um, slim. Right? They had to establish schools for their children, uh, the children to go to. They weren't provided to them by, um, uh, you know, you know, any kind of suburban governmental structure. Right? So, so when I say spatial inheritances, a lot of those unincorporated suburbs are the suburbs that African-Americans, black immigrants have moved to today, or right? think of places like Amityville, and, um, other towns on Long Island that have been around for a very long time. Um, and then you have other kinds of, of issues around, what does it mean when a black family moves into an area like Levittown that was historically created for whites only, right? And so they're inheriting um, the racial coding and the racial exclusions that uh, that town was built off of, making it very difficult for them to 
feel as if they really belong there and that their children um, can feel as if they are, are, are citizens of that space as well. So those are the kinds of issues that I try to unpack um, in, in the chapter called Blood Pudding. And I think really impacts how their, my interviewees think about their relationship to suburban, suburban life. Yeah, really, really interesting. And Kim, can you talk a little bit about sort of the politics of exclusion versus inclusion and in, in uh, black sure. suburbs? I mean, I think that, so I should say that uh, I should out myself as a former, recently former suburbanite. Um, I lived in a famously uh, proudly historic a uh, diverse, clinically integrated suburb, Montclair, New Jersey. So for those of you, yay. Um, and I think that really, I think is was a, a really interesting moment um, for me uh, because I think it, it showed that, um, yes, we have, a, a I think, a suburban politics of, of exclusion, but I think we also have longstanding as well as emerging politics of uh, suburban, uh, suburban politics of inclusion. Um, as well as I think if we look at the more majority black suburbs, um, uh, 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 suburban politics of opportunity, I would call it. And so I think again, thinking about these differences that in suburbs that have, I have decided through often very tough political processes that you know we are diverse, um, diversity is here to stay and how do we make it work? Um, and so I think in, in these, diverse suburbs, the politics are very interesting. It's not necessarily solely about exclusion. It's about how do we make a place of inclusion that works for people? How do we make sure that uh, the school system really effectively serves the different kinds of kids who are um, going to the school? How do we ensure that the police department actually treats all the residents of that suburb in a, in a fair and equitable and just way? How do we even think about public, you know, uh, recreation services, um, realizing that one of the things I think that's different about say black suburbanization uh, as opposed to sort of traditional white suburbanization has been the historic uh, uh, impact uh, and role of, of dual uh, income earners or also in multi-generational and as well as multi-generational families. Um, and so these are different kinds of families um, or households that are living in these suburban spaces. And so how do we make the suburban space work for these different kinds of families. Um, so I think for those kinds of suburbs that, that realize that diversity is here to stay and how do we sort of make it work, um, that creates, I think, an interesting set of political possibilities. For majority black suburbs, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, path. I think that for upper income suburbs, certainly I think there's a the fear that if they become, um, I think for all black, majority black spaces, um, there is the fear as well as I think the reality that often they are seen as the sites of metropolitan uh, Lulu's, locally unwanted land uses, um, mm -hmm. that these black spaces are seen as, oh, we should site you know, uh, a landfill here, or oh, we should site supportive housing here, or oh, we should site a jail here. Um, and I think that for uh, black suburban spaces, part of their politics of exclusion, if you will, is to not not allow for these spaces to become sites where other communities kind of put what they don't want there. Um, but in terms of inclusion, I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen in um, particularly low in lower income black suburbs are a real sense that, you know, we're kind of like cities. We kind of have to figure out how do we get people who are not in the employment, in the labor market, back into the labor market? How do we sort of deal with the issues of um, uh, exploitive landlords, for example. How do we deal with uh, uh, financing these spaces? And so I think these kinds of politics, I think, are very different from your typical, say, majority white suburb. Um, and I think that that's something that we really need to better understand. Yeah, fascinating. So much to write a book about that, Kim. So, um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, um, ask you a little bit about sort of turn turn the conversation to to identity which I think is a, a big part of what Orly's book focuses on um you know there is there is um difficult it's difficult to prove but I think quite quite a bit of suggestive evidence that that people are shaped by 
the communities, the neighborhoods that uh, where they grow up. And and so um, I'm curious, sort of, if you if you could both talk about maybe starting with Orly, sort of how uh, particularly Black millennials and Black um, Gen Zers are shaped by um, growing up in in Black suburbs or or growing up in 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 diverse suburbs. Um, and you know, I, I think you find in your book that the um, uh, that the sort of that 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 in Great Park that sort of that the black residents walked away with sort of a greater sense of pro-blackness and, and I don't know sort of whether that's something that you would generalize but if you could talk a little bit about that and then maybe Kim you could talk a little bit about how political identity is is shaped by by your spaces. Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, Cause I, you know, I didn't talk much about uh, millennials in my book, but I am working on a second book project, which, which focuses on uh, black youth who I interviewed um, uh, during, during, during my study in, in 2008 to 20, 2016. Um, and the black youth who I interviewed were the children of the adults who are in the new noir, right? So I was able to really unpack this kind of intergenerational understanding of issues of race, you know, class and, and, and identity, which was, um, which I think really rich. And, and the black youth who I spoke to, they were between the ages of 14 and 20 and 21, right? So many of whom, you know, were in high school, um, some of whom who, were, you know, they were living at home um, and going to kind of local community or kind of state colleges and universities, um, et cetera. And so, um, one pattern that I found amongst particularly the high school students is that they really, um, they, were, they were living pretty privileged lives, right? And their kind of, kind of repertoires and understandings of, of themselves, right? They were growing up in single family homes. Um, you know, they're, you know, for the most part, their parents um, had, uh, you know, very stable, stable jobs. Um, and they were able to make sure that the family had everything that they needed. In some circumstances, young people were going to private schools, right? So, and you know, on Long Island, uh, which has some of the highest property taxes in the country, parents were still amassing, um, you know, money and income and earnings to send their children to private schools, right? To ensure that um, they would transfer their their, their kind of class status to, to their to their children through, through education, right? So. Some of these kids were, were, were living pretty, pretty what I would say, privileged lives. Um, but it's also important to note that they were coming of age um, during the Great Recession, right? So things were not perfect in, by any stretch of the, the imagination, right? Um, there were quite a few families who I interviewed, young people who, you know, uh, disclosed to me that their, you know, parents, you know, that their houses might be undergoing foreclosure or that they had friends or neighbors who um, you know, had to move out of the neighborhood because, because of the foreclosure crisis, right? As many of us can remember, um, uh, areas of Queens and Long Island, specifically Black and Latinx areas, mm -hmm. um, there was high rates of, of home ownership. They um, were targeted by um, predatory, um, you know, predatory lending and therefore were you know, heavily impacted by the foreclosure crisis and the decline of the economy, right? Um, there were, some families where you know one parent did lose the job, right, and therefore um, either the mother or the father really had to um, you know make up for that kind of lost income, and that really put their housing uh, in jeopardy, right. And so I think it's a really complex story depending on um, what kind of you know socioeconomic makeup the, the the young person was was growing up in. But I think for the most part, these young people understood that they were kind of living in this world where they had more than say some of the students that they went to school with or maybe their cousins back in Brooklyn or you know South South Bronx, right? Um, but they also it was also really clear that um, that they had to work really hard, right, in order to um, not necessarily help their parents, but to meet the demands that their parents were placing on them so that they would achieve and have a life that was a lot more stable um, um, than perhaps what their, their parents were, um, might've been experiencing, right? So they were you know, growing up in middle-class households, but all around them, the economic structure was really falling apart. 
um, I think it's also important to note that this was during this, this study was done during the Obama era, right? So as much as there was, uh, you know, the sense that there's significant economic security locally and globally, these young people were also like, well, our president is black, right? So um, I think it really expanded their imagination about what they could potentially yeah. achieve, right? So I think that um, what they are experiencing is really no different than what many other black millennials in other places, which is, you know, these real contradictions between racial progress and, um, you know, uh, racial and economic uh, re reentrenchment. so. Yeah, sort of one step forward, two steps back. Yeah, so. Um, so Kim, and then um, I'm going to go to the audience Q and A after. We've got some really good questions so far, but please send them in. So, Kim, on sort of political identity and the extent to which it's shaped by your communities. Um, I think it's a couple of things. First, you know, just again from my own experience of living in a, in a you know diverse suburb, I think for many young people, um, both black and white, there is a real culture shock. When they live, leave their their bubble, um, and they go to onto the workforce or to higher ed, um, that for whatever kind of tensions are apparent in their suburban home, you know, it's it's a different world once they step outside of their sort of diverse bubble. And I think that that's an interesting thing about looking at how young people kind of negotiate going from a place in which race and ethnicity. Um, are sort of more openly spoken about, that there are more, are more sort of open struggles over issues to places where uh, these issues are unspoken um, and certain power assumptions are actually realized. Um, and so I think that that's an interesting, I think there's always, you know, an interesting moment when you meet these, you know, young people who come back to visit and they're like, kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, the world is like mm, um, problematic. Um, but I think for uh, for you know young people who are in more uh, black majority spaces, I think that in many ways um, it is both uh, I think a source of identity, um, but also I think it is a source of realization that you know their space doesn't necessarily look like um, the other spaces. So why does uh, our school not have AP courses? Uh, why uh, do we not have really nice um, uniforms? Um, you know, why uh, uh, is the, uh, why do we have a junior ROTC program in or our high school, but the other high school, which is majority white, doesn't have a junior ROTC program. So I think that there are ways in which, you know, in these, I think, especially majority black spaces, um, I think racial identity becomes uh, I think gets uh, gets created in very sharp ways um, that I think kids who are coming from more racially diverse backgrounds um, are, are not quite exposed to. But it's certainly, I think for all of these young people, I think given the sort of racial wealth gap um, and given most uh, African-American households are kind of in a state of, you know, financial precarity. Um, and so I think that financial precarity or potential precarity, precariousness kind of underlies a lot of black family life, what, no matter how well to do um, one is, um, that one's presence in a single family home, you know, it could be a, a three or four or five paychecks away. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, there are, um, you know, so many, so there are so many more questions I want to ask, but there's some great questions in the um, in the chat. I want to combine um, sort of two of them for for Orly, um, but Kim, you should chime in if you have thoughts as well. Is somebody asked why um, Westchester County was not part of this research, and you could speak to sort of how you selected your study areas, and then um, someone else basically kind of asked the generalizability question, which is to what extent, um, you know, would you find similar patterns had you looked at um, the suburbs of Atlanta, the suburbs of, you know, Washington DC, Prince George's County, um, so I wonder, and, and Westchester now, so. Yes, thank you for those questions. So um, in terms of the first question, why um, Westchester County? So this study is, um, uh, you know, a part of my 
dissertation work. And um, I was drawn to do this dissertation because there were you know, specific realities uh, that were happening on the ground um, in, in Queens, right? So there, for example, were so many New York Times articles that were coming out saying that you know, black incomes in Queens, New York are you know, significantly higher um, than white household incomes, right? And, and for anyone who you know, studies race and economics, that really turns the reality, the existing kind of assumption about the kind of uh, racial um, income gap and the racial wealth gap kind of on its head. And so I, I was drawn to, to Queens because of that. Um, and um, what really became the icing on the cake in terms of me selecting Queens as my first uh, uh, site of study um, was that although uh, black household incomes in Queens were you know, significantly higher um, than whites, there were also reports that um, black children uh, were experiencing issues of racial exclusion in schools. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about this you know, during my light presentation, but there were instances of, you know, anti-Haitian discrimination and of anti, you know, Black youth discrimination happening from white administ uh, administrators um, uh, in elementary and junior, and junior high schools within um, uh, Queens areas that were predominantly Black and middle class, right? And so these kinds of contradictions really drew me to the space and I decided, well, I wanted to, to go into this kind of, you know, um, multinational, predominantly black, you know, middle-class area to, you know, inquire what, what is really happening there, right? Isn't, you know, a move to Queens, I grew up in Brooklyn, I didn't get a chance to say this, isn't a move to Queens um, really moving on up, right? Isn't it that the black families who move there are supposed to experience better schools, better housing, uh, you know, all of the assumptions, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I quickly began to realize that the those were things that really are, were created in, in this kind of white uh, imaginary, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons why I ended up doing the study in Queens and then choosing a comparative case on Long Island um, that was racially uh, integrated, but that still had a kind of multinational black middle class population. Um, but I think the study could also be done in Westchester, um, Westchester County <clears throat> and other um, parts of, of New York where we're seeing some of the demographic trends. And in, term of gen in terms of generalizability, you know, I, I kind of push back against the question of generalizability because this is a, uh, you know, an ethnography, right? And so it's a, it's a study of a specific place and a specific time and specific people. Um, but you, I, I do think that you can see similar trends um, in other um, Black diasporic cities, right? So when I think about Atlanta, Atlanta has a very strong, um, you know, Black American Southern uh, rich culture, heritage, uh, mm -hmm. history, but you also have a large number of Black immigrants who have been moving there, not necessarily straight from um, the Caribbean or Africa, but they've actually actually moving uh, from the North, right? They're moving from Boston, uh, you know, New York, New Jersey, and they're choosing to move down to the uh, Atlanta suburbs so that they could um, kind of Achieve, achieve this kind of, you know, dream of home ownership and, you know, large backyards, et cetera, and, and leave these you know, black middle class um, uh, lifestyles that they perhaps could not leave, leave because of the exorbitantly high cost of living in the North, right? Um, so I think that there is work that can be done on um, black high school, uh, you know, communities and suburbs and I believe DeKalb County and uh, um, um, in Georgia, this can also I think happen in cities like Washington D.C., which have a large number of Ethiopians, um, as well as Nigerians and other Caribbean immigrants who are living side by side with you know, Black Americans, or even ask some of the questions about how they're negotiating. So. That's great. Um, yeah, and it, you should push back against the generalizability question, but but it's it's hard not to. To read your book and, and not be curious about that. Um, but yes, the whole point is about the rich diversity and the heterogeneity. So, but um, there, so it, lots of good questions here. Um, you know, maybe maybe I'll pick up on this one because it, it, it follows up on our conversation about identity, but this specifically asks about civic identity. Um, and so, um, Kim, I don't know, maybe you could talk about that, take this one first, is whether members of Black communities and other um, 
and in, in black communities in places like Montclair, do they usually have a stronger um, civic identity? Um, so I have two things. I mean, I just want to touch a little bit on the general generalizability uh, mm -hmm. question. Um, so in my work and then work I'm now doing with uh, 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 Larue Lewis McCoy, um, as well as uh, graduate student Tara Dowds, I mean, I think what we found is that um, there are clusters of black suburbs in a lot of different metropolitan areas that experience, and uh, we can see a lot of different similarities as well as similar differences. Um, and so I think that, you know, while Orly's work provides a really interesting in-depth case, I think that one of the things that we should keep in mind is that, you know, black suburbs are just as different from each other as white suburbs are different from each other. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on ideas about general and generalizability as well. Um, but I think in terms of political identities, I think what's interesting about, um, you know, if we look at a place like Montclair versus its neighbor, East Orange, which is probably the largest black suburb um, in the United States, it's about 90, 000, 80, 90,000 people, um, is that uh, Montclair's uh, black population start off um, has been longstanding. Um, that in fact, it is uh, also, a, it was a space for formerly enslaved um, and as well as a very strong uh, black middle class starting from the early 20th century. Um, so I think there's always been a certain level of, of civic engagement. Um, and a lot of the families who've lived in Montclair have lived in Montclair for, for decades. Um, in places like East Orange, I think that's an interesting sort of counter case right over the border um, that uh, underwent a sort of rapid shift in, uh, in, in demographics from majority white to majority black within a decade. And I think that politically it's been very interesting. Um, as a sort of new pl black political class has emerged in East Orange um, that really is not engaged in the politics of, of integration, uh, but more of, you know, here we are in this city, how do we sort of, you know, make the city better for the people who live in the city? Will we uh, embrace a transit oriented development? Um, should we sell off, you know, the city owned golf course? I mean, it, you know, it's a very, I think, interesting, different kind of politics that really is not necessarily about intra intraracial interracial mm -hmm. difference, but really about you know what's the best path forward for for the city. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So um, maybe we'll. I don't know whether we maybe maybe we have time for two more questions. But um, so one. Um, one question, maybe just, I don't know if any of this can be a short question, if we can get two more questions in. Um, but let me just tell you them both now. So one, one question is, is how, um, how the racial wealth gap affects the black suburbs. And I think both of you touched on this a little bit actually, but I wonder if you could um, uh, look at that and someone asked about whether you saw variation between black families in the sample by immigration status. And, and then if there's time, um, somebody asked an open-ended question of sort of what surprised you most in, in your research and maybe we could end on that note. So yes, I, I touched on it briefly and I'll try to keep this very short, but the racial wealth gap, um, um, which is, uh, if, I, if I have it correctly, it's, it's white families have um, a set of wealth that is 10, ten times higher than, than black families, right? That is, um, that's, that's, that can be very uh, damning, right? And for example, in a time like of the current pandemic that we're living in, right? I, I would um, argue that, uh, in, you know, in, in times of economic downturn, whether it was the Great Recession when I was doing my research, or this, um, you know, economic, um, um, you know, recession or you know, pseudo recession that we're experiencing right now, that Black families just have less um, wealth, uh, i.e., assets, i.e., you know, disposable income. Um, to, to, to work with, right? To, to deal with, uh, you know, any, any kind of economic precarity that comes their way. So if someone, for example, loses, loses a job or, um, you know, we have this major issue of healthcare in America, right? One of the issues, one of the reasons why um, so many are living in economic dire straits is because we don't have comprehensive 
healthcare um, as an option. That's that's especially the case for um, Black folks in in the U.S. Right, and so if you don't have the disposable income or the investments that you can liquidate in order to pay for certain healthcare costs, then that's going to put your family in, in very kind of difficult uh, uh, economic situations. And so oftentimes people choose to just maybe opt out of getting um, that procedure done, right? Or, um, you know, you are unable to, um, you know, send your kids to certain types of schools or give them access to certain types of after, after school activities that white families are able to do because not necessarily because that the, the parent has the money to help the, the, their child, but because the grandparents are transferring money um, into their accounts to help them support intergenerational mobility of their children. And so these are just things, everyday issues that black families um, have to negotiate really on their own. Meanwhile, whites um, you know, have, have just a lot more assets to, to, yeah. to work, to deal with them. More cushion. Sure. Yeah, I, I actually just want to jump in and say that, you know, one of the things that we've seen, especially um, in the 2007-2008, uh, was that Black suburban spaces were, were spaces of, of, of predation, um, yeah. that these were spaces that were targeted by some prime mortgage lenders. Um, and so I think thinking about the sort of vast amount of Black wealth that was lost through this wave of foreclosures because these spaces were targeted, I think is important because that forecloses the opportunity to pass down wealth, whether uh, in the form of assistance with a down payment, mm -hmm. uh, making, uh, you know, making it more possible that a student doesn't have to uh, mm -hmm. uh, take out a, a larger student loan. Um, and I think it, it sort of compounds itself that then these houses are undervalued relative to houses occupied by, by white. Um, and that because of unequal access to credit, um, black households find themselves paying more for housing with less value at the end of it. Um, and so again, I think about the sort of intergenerational effects mm -hmm. of, 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 of wealth kind of leaving, uh, never accruing and or leaving the black community. Yeah, it was significant. So, so Orly, in the last minute, maybe you could just tell us sort of quickly what surprised you most in your research. That's that's a great question. Um, there were a lot of surprises. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of surprises, but the the one um, I think that comes to mind the most was that even in these integrated neighborhoods on Long Island, Long Island, I call it a, a black suburbs, but, but really it's, it's one third black, one third Latinx and one third white. Um, and you know, as much as in the US we want to believe in the kind of integration project and experiments, um, you know, if white families don't buy into that and don't believe in it, then it's, it's not going to work, right? And so um, there were so many circumstances where um, the families who I spoke to said, you know, we wanted to live in this neighborhood because we, you know, assumed it was more diverse, right? Um, and it would be interesting for our kids to grow up here, but they had white neighbors who had very little interest in interacting with them. And they felt mm -hmm. as if, um, you know, and, and, and their white neighbors had children who, who, had, who were the same age as theirs, right? And so even in these integrated environments that there were these kind of new forms and patterns of exclusion kind of coming up. And um, one tactic that white parents were using was just putting their kids also in private school, right? So they right. went into with the increasing number of black children who are in the neighborhood. So that really surprised me. And I think mm -hmm. challenge um, any kind of notion that in, you know, addressing racial injustice, historical uh, legacies of slavery and Jim Crow through integration, um, that that is um, not necessary, it's, it's, it's just not the way forward. We need real policy. Yeah, yeah. On that, thank you for that. Um, well, let, let me just quickly, before I turn it to Mary, just um, thank Kim and Orly for this conversation. It's really a privilege for me to be in a conversation with, with both of you. The book is fantastic. The cover is beautiful, but the insides are also um, just uh, you know incredibly compelling. So thank you for, for sharing the book. Thank you for, for taking the time to have this conversation. So Mary? Thank you so much, Ingrid. Uh, what great questions and thoughts. I really wish we had another hour together, but since we don't, on behalf of NYU Wagner and the Urban Initiative, we'd like to thank our amazing speakers, Orly, Kim, and Ingrid, 
and our event producers, Raquel Forrester, Susan Lee, and Ankira Singleton. And most importantly, all of you for joining us for this important and timely conversation. As a reminder, we will email and share out today's event recording, and we hope that you'll continue the conversation and join us for future events at wagner.nyu.edu forward slash events. Thank you again to our speakers, and thank you everyone for your time and interest. Have a good afternoon and take care.